everybody. Can you, is this on? Can you hear me in back? Okay, so uh, thank you for being here. Um, it's, I'm, first of all, I should say my name is Rob Jackson. I'm a professor here in Earth System Science. I know some of you, but uh, not all of you, and nice to be back in the classroom, as always. It's my pleasure today to introduce Marcella Mena, who's um, really a, has been an incredible mix of scientist, engineer, um, advocate, and successful policymaker. So that's what you'll hear about today, and I'm uh, excited to, uh, to hear about it. To give you just a very brief background, um, uh, Marcelo has degrees in biochemical engineering, civil and environmental engineering, both here in the United States at Iowa State and in Chile, where he is from and is currently based. Um, in the last five years, just to give you a, a few examples of his high energy, he was the environment minister for the country of Chile, and he went from there to the World Bank, and just, uh, just recently was named the inaugural CEO for the brand new methane hub. And the Methane Hub is a $300 million commitment from philanthropic organizations, not, not to do research on methane, but to reduce methane concentrations and emissions around the world. So it's really a results and solutions-based effort. And, many, and Marcelo is here on the West Coast because these uh, philanthropic organizations came together and are planning sort of how to implement that. So we'll hear a bit about the Hub, but I think today we'll hear more about Marcelo's personal and professional mission um, let me give you just a few examples of what he accomplished as the as the environment minister. And this is on his uh, the website from his uh, TED talk. Um, uh, Marcelo spearheaded multiple environmental initiatives such as taxes on new car sales and power generation based on local and global air pollution, the first of their kinds around the world. He helped craft a landmark agreement to phase out coal power generation in Chile. He created 45,000 square kilometers of national parks protected 1.3 million square kilometers of ocean, and instituted the first national plastic bag ban in the Americas. So it's, suffice it to say he got a lot done while he was environment minister, and he's gonna get a lot done as CEO of the Methane Hub. So take it away, Marcelo. Okay. Yeah. Do you have a, have oh, a I, I lavalier? Okay. Thanks so much. Yes, thank you so much for, for the opportunity to speak. I, this is like probably my second uh, in-person uh, engagement in since the pandemic, so bear with me. I, yeah. So the, it should be coming up. Just one sec. Maybe, so, am I, do I need to do something here with the screen? Or, should be up, right? Okay. I'll do the classic plug it and then plug it. Make sure it works. There we go. Okay, good. Then I guess I gotta switch it out. Good. Cool. Thanks. So well, first off, you know, we're, we're in the middle of a, a discussion about climate change, but when I wor worked in the World Bank, I really liked uh, Nicholas Stern's, you know, one of the first, the, the economists that, that led the World Bank on this issue, saying that, you know, if we want to overcome global poverty, climate change and global poverty are both sides of the same coin, they must be addressed together. If we fail on one, we'll fail on the other. And I think it's really important that we take that message home. It is not about the environment. It's about poverty. It's about human well-being um, and also we have uh, a tall task in order I don't know I assume you've seen the the requirements for meeting net zero or keeping warming under 1.5 degree but essentially it's a mitigation that we've never ever done at the scale and I guess the pandemic sort of gave us the hope that we, we would for the first time would be in the right direction but of course, we came back to our old ways and there's a rebound effect. And a lot of the new uh, energy that was required in many places was actually coal again, unfortunately. The Paris Agreement requires uh, countries to, to have net zero emissions by 2050. And, if, and things are changing. Because in 2019, things were pretty bleak. And I, I like to say, say that uh, always think of these things in a positive way. You know, if we looked at what everybody was committing to, it was a total disaster of a future. But, 
you know, it, it's uh, four years ago, uh, things have changed substantially. The U.S. is back in leadership roles. However, you know, it, with all its complications, it's way different to have a, a country committed to climate mitigation without, in comparison to another one that, that is not. Same goes, we have commitments by China, by India, the EU, and almost 100 countries that have committed to net zero emissions by 2050. And, and these are some slides that I, I stole from Drew Schindel. Uh, to limit warming to 1.5 degrees, we had to reduce emissions by 45% net global by 2030. Uh, we could, we, if we want to do two degrees, it's a little bit later. Um, and if we want to re limit warming to 1.5 degrees, uh, we have to reach net zero by 2050. And a little bit later, if we want to do two degrees again. And this is something um, and, and something that we should focus. But my focus in, in my career has always been trying to find the multiple reasons why we should be doing the right thing. And many times it's looking at non-CO2 pollutants overall that provide immediate health benefits that allow you to have the, the political space under which to support these things. Because when you're in a, in a small country like Chile that accounts for 0.3% of global emissions, uh, there are people that say, you know, why are we doing this? What's in it for us? It's the U.S. or it's China or it's somebody else's fault. Um, but then you provide a pathway of lower energy cost and cleaner air, which also provides multiple health benefits. And so what we need to do is something we've never done before, uh, and it's about multiple changes. It's about, you know, I heard a great uh, speaker talking about, is there a sustainable shrimp? Yes, there is. Is there an all-you-can-eat sustainable shrimp restaurant? No, there is not because it's about being balanced, about having what you require overall. And to me, the, the whole fight is very personal because it's my kids, it's this decade, and so of, of, you know, somebody that got in first, you know, first grade or now, by the time they're a freshman in, in high school, that's when we had to reduce emissions by half. Right, so it's a very difficult task. But the positive thing, and I'm gonna go into the, some global analysis, new climate economy, Nick Stern and others, showed that actually meeting the Paris Agreement goals, mitigating climate change, actually provides substantial economic benefits. And some of the work I did in the World Bank uh, was actually to provide evidence of uh, adaptation. Today, there's a new report uh, working Group 2, IPCC, talks about how vulnerable we are and how, how uh, we're losing that window under which we need to adapt to climate change. Well, now we have some good evidence to also uh, have adaptation, not be the poor, the, the poor uh, uh, um, uh, child of, uh, or sibling of the, or whatever, the, the, of mitig versus mitigation, but actually having a new opportunities to look at these things. So investing in a early warning system, very cost effective, making infrastructure resilient, very cost effective, uh, climate smart agriculture that's adapted to climate change also. Uh, even some things that we have to do much more, uh, looking at the benefits of nature-based solutions is something we do not have a full handle on, but whenever we have looked at the information, there are substantial benefits. Protecting e coastal ecosystems, particularly, are very cost effective and having sustainable uh, or, or, or um, resilient water resources systems. But then, 2020, pandemic hits. We know how vulnerable we are uh, to these zoonotic diseases as we've expanded and encroached where, uh, where different um, uh, species used to live. And around three-fourths of new diseases are zoonotic in origin. It has to do with biodiversity loss. So. The world is in the middle of a new agreement that's going to be in, in China, I think it's this year, um, it, which is the, 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 the Conference for Biodiversity, the CBD COP, and the commitment that they're trying to achieve is the Global Deal for Nature, which is protecting 30% of the oceans and lands by 2030. And the good thing about it is that achieving that protection, according to Waldron uh, and others, from Cambridge actually has five times more benefits than cost. So therefore also conserving land, conserving oceans, keeping places sacred from extraction is very important. 
So I am very proud to have contributed to have my own country increase the protection from 8% to 36%, which is a substantial increase. And I, I love the fact that um, th these things actually come to uh, have results that are positive. I went to grad school here in the US. I heard about the Chilean sea bass becoming in, fat, in style. Then in a decade, 95% of all resources were depleted. Orange roughy also came in style. 70 year old fish, you know, <laughs> prehistoric and, and very difficult to reproduce. It were so totally over depleted. And I did meet a fisherman recently, uh, Juan Fernandez Archipelago, one of the places that we protected. And he told me with, with a lot of emotion that it's great to fish things that had not been fished for 20 years, uh, having different species that, that hadn't seen in a while. So nature does recover. If we stay away from our constant temptation to kill the golden egg goose and, uh, before letting the eggs just be given to us overall. So my country has had that depletion, but we have changed that two thirds of the fisheries are overfished and we've changed that uh, tendency. So our emissions, well, first thing I like, what I like about this plot is that they're on the rise as all growing economies have. But we have sinks, right? We have a Patagonian forest, we have multiple native uh, trees. So, so yeah, net zero is an option, but Santiago was very polluted in 1990 and we were net zero then. So net zero doesn't mean clean air, right? So we have to still be looking at a pathway that's also just and meets other goals. It's not only about not uh, having total emissions. And so what I like about the pathway that we have to choose in Chile is that we have a very clear path uh, with no regrets. Option A, Swiss Re put out a report last year showing that uh, Chile will lose 8 to 27 percent of its GDP by 2048. Um, 50 I put in there, um, if we don't address climate change. But if we actually went to net zero, we actually would have more growth, which I think is really important. And I'll tell you a little bit of why this is sort of a consensus, because it's not, it's not, uh, it doesn't happen a lot that the left wing and the right wing all have a consensus that net zero is our pathway. First off, 2013, I remember gave a talk here in Stanford and talked about the things that we needed to do and what we planning to do with President Bachelet's administration. And, and a lot of things we did, and we actually had unexpected results. We started uh, what I do believe to be an energy revolution, and we did it three ways. We put a price on pollution. And you can see not a, many countries in the world have put a price on pollution, and none of them actually have it to the level that you require to reflect the externalities that are associated to the, the emissions that we want to regulate. One of the things that I also uh, did with, uh, w with uh, Chile was something I hope will be picked up again, which was the carbon pricing of the Americas Declaration under which Chile, Colombia, Peru, Costa Rica, Mexico, California, Oregon, Washington, and Canada committed to have an integrated regional uh, carbon price market. It, it hasn't picked up since I left, but uh, hopefully you know, the new administration could, could pick that up. Another thing that happened was a power plant emission standard. So I wanna give you uh, this, this point because the first thing I said was climate related. But the second thing is air pollution related. And most people overlook, when they see this only as a climate agenda, they overlook these, these opportunities. And so I remember we did this regulation in 2009 and we showed that it had two times more benefits than cost and we were able to adopt the EU standard for emissions and even having something in the US took a while to do, which is uh, uh, forcing existing power plants to retrofit and meet that standard. And that increased their capital cost at around 30% and changed the economics of power generation substantially. And so this picture I would get from people that, that would operate these plants. I was always the activist. I was always talking to the, to the different community people. And, and the guys would say, you know, we would shut off the power, the power plant controls when there's no enforcement. And um, because obviously uh, it, takes out, it takes out power when you have these uh, controls. And so what we did there was continuous monitoring of emissions. There's no, no lack of compliance. Then we put the power plant emission, uh, the, the, the carbon tax 
that's building on that capacity of continuous monitoring. And so therefore, it was great for me to, when I visited the plants in 2017 and 2018, to come into the power plant and look at the guy trying to make sure two things occur. That he, they look at the power output and how much carbon tax are paying. And, and, and if they're meeting the mission standard, and I think it's just great because they, since uh, also the local air pollution portion of the tax is very substantial, they actually went far beyond what was required by the emission standard because it was always cheaper to mitigate than to pay the tax, which was much higher. One of the things that I liked about this whole approach, including other stuff we did for air pollution, which I haven't gotten into detail, but essentially we, do, we did multiple air pollution uh, control programs. And the, the big newspaper went out to see, probably wanted to look and see that we failed miserably at what we wanted. But they figured out something I hadn't figured out. They looked into emergency room visits for bronchi uh, obstructive bronchial uh, disease. And, um, and it was actually reduced by 50% in many places that we had taken action. And overall, emergency room visits uh, for, for uh, kids between 0 and 14 years old were dropped around 30%. So I. I have to say I'm very proud of this. This is probably the biggest goal, the achievement that I've had because it's 500,000 cases. If any of you have ever taken your kid to emergency room because they can't breathe, it's terrible. Uh, and and 500,000 cases prevented is something I'm very proud of. So combination, market conditions for end transition, increased capital costs for power generation, increased operational costs for the green tax, energy auction reform, and then this coal phase out just net was natural. And I'll show you why in terms of economics. First off, um, this is like the Lazard levelized cost of energy. These things have, have been present in Chile probably six years ahead of the global analysis. So, so let no one ever tell you that new energy from solar and wind is not only the cheapest source of energy, but that's actually the cheapest source of energy mankind has ever had. This is, I think, is great, great news. And IEA pr uh, projects that we will have uh, around 95% of all new energy globally to be renewable by 2030. So that's, some, that's a fact. But also, increasingly, it's cheaper to build new renewable operations than to continue to operate existing power plants. Third. Battery storage is coming down fast, and it will be uh, covering the path of least resistance, I believe. We will probably have a future under which landlines, transmission lines are going to be hard to, to build out anywhere. LA, California overall, the US, and Chile too. The last big transmission line we had was a nightmare. I, I permitted it with the Minister of Energy. We are going millimeter by millimeter, trying to get it pushed through. I don't think 10 years down the line it's going to be easier at all. And the next one's not going to go through a desert. It's going to go through where people live, and it's going to be a nightmare. So what I think is going to be a lot of battery storage uh, overall. This is another analysis uh, from Bloomberg and Energy Finance showing that this is the case also in China, India, and Germany, in which building new uh, solar and wind is actually cheaper than continuing to operate existing power plants. So with my colleague, the Minister of Energy. We would always talk about that we were dancing to the song, but we hadn't put a name on it, it with no new coal, right? So essentially, at the end of the government, we, uh, we, we announced this coal phase-out agreement, and basically, basically based out of economics. Other cool thing that we need to do now, uh, and Be President Bachelet, who had been known in her first government to have increased coal production because of natural gas shortages from Argentina, got to have uh, this agreement to phase out coal. And I'm very proud of have contributed to that. But there's other baseload energy that we have to uh, 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 address and support. So um, CSP, you guys have some CSP here in, in California, concentrated solar power. They run 24-7. Um, and so we have our first one that came in at $130 per megawatt hour, but the new ones are actually coming at $30 per megawatt hour, so that bit takes us to another stage. Battery storage already starting out many places in Chile. The big, uh, big companies like NG and NL are already building the first ones, 
and I, I am sure it, anywhere we have solar power today probably will be backed up with battery storage because that's the way to do it because we cannot continue this pathway of super ultra cheap solar energy at daytime being supported by expensive nighttime diesel or other sources. This project, I, which is funded by the Green Climate Fund, I truly want to succeed. It's actually from Stanford alumni. Uh, it's called Valhalla Energy and uh, Espejo Tarapacá. It's about having super cheap solar be used to pump up ocean water into this artificial lagoon and have nighttime uh, sea salt uh, hydro work. They say they could deliver this energy around $60 per megawatt hour. If they can, we ha we've solved a lot of the battery storage requirements. We've solved a lot of the uh, um, other type of energy that we don't want. And so there are different people that are thinking about 100% renewable. And you know, uh, for example, if we phased out coal faster by 2025, for example, we would require substantial amount of new installed capacity. So the way that I see it, because you know, many policymakers think you know, investment in growth is a good thing. But when it comes to environment, they think this is negative. Oh, it's going to cost us so much. But really, it's about job creation. It is about investment. And I, I think that's going to work out fine if we are smart about the way that we do it. But we have to be strong about the policy orientations we need to give to the technocrats, because many times the technocrats are stuck with their old ways. They listen to the incumbents more than new uh, players. And the big success of the Chilean energy policy was stopping listening to the incumbents and actually listening to the renewable energy sector that has proven its uh, potential. So electromobility, I'm going to talk to you about that a little bit too. Uh, it is a problem, and I think in the US it's a big problem that you have uh, not a truly open market to cheap technologies if necessary. So I have a friend who works at the Department of Transportation in Minnesota. And he's saying, how, am I, how, come, how do you guys have so many electric buses in Santiago? I'm like, because they're Chinese or 300,000 each. It's like, really? We pay a million each one, right? So of course, if you want to pay a million dollars for an electric bus, the payback from a diesel bus will never occur. But the thing is, in our case, the, the operational costs are su uh, substantially cheaper. Uh, a fourth of the uh, you know, maintenance cost in, in the electricity, et cetera. So uh, essentially, the, the, the electric bus pays itself off in three years. And if you're having a five-year contract, then, you, then you're going with a no-brainer decision of going for electric buses to be 100% of your new fleet. So today we have 1,500 electric buses, and we probably could, if we wanted to, have 100% electric buses. The incoming Boric administration, who has very talented transport in, uh, uh, minister and the very talented uh, environment minister, their proposal actually ha is to have free transportation, free public transportation, and it probably could be achieved easier with lower operational costs associated to electric uh, ways of uh, production and transportation. Now, what, what's, uh, what's going on today, though, we are at 24% renewable energy, which is an astounding uh, ac accomplishment considering the fact that we had no solar and wind in 2014, basically. So that's great. The bad thing, though, is that last year, coal grew from 30 to 35%, which is bad news. And goes to show that the phase out agreement that we did could have been a little bit you know, tighter, could have been a little bit more stringent. Some sticks could have been thrown, too many carrots, because essentially the, the, coal, the operation, the, operation uh, was the, the, the plants that were put in the plan were probably plants that never operated that much anyway. Just, I'm going to go to the last portion of the, the presentation talking about why we could go to net zero faster, right? Because, of course, yeah, 2050 is fine. But this is a little bit like don't look up, right? You want to shoot the comet just at the right thing. But what happens if you miss? You know, if you miss, uh, you had one shot, right? And so 2040, I believe, should be the, 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 
the date, and I'll show you our NDC, what, it, what it's about. Today, I, I do respect the fact that in the middle of the pandemic, somebody would commit to net zero, right? I mean, this is 2020. Nobody had committed to, no, no big uh, country had committed to net zero. Uh, you needed to show the momentum. Chile was a COP president, but developing country in the middle of a social unrest and crisis and with an with a economic crisis that we didn't know how, how long it was going to last. So I do respect the fact that uh, my, pre my successor, the Gagne Schmidt and Juan Carlos Llobet, the Minister of Energy, did this commitment. Um, and so they, they, they committed to peak emissions by 2025, uh, do 45% um, do, uh, um, uh, reduction by 2030 and net zero by 2050. And the interesting thing is that while in 2020, that was the total amount of countries that had committed to net zero, I can't plot the, the, the new number. It's uh, around 150 countries that have committed to net zero by now. And overall, uh, the, this carbon neutrality is the consensus. Industry thinks we should do net zero. The power sector says we should do net zero. All universities say we should do net zero. And the, what it would mean, it would be a big injection of investments, and which will lead to increasing uh, savings in the cheaper energy you would have for your, for your homes overall. But then, now in Chile, we're having a discussion whether we should be applying to have this by 2050 or 2040, right? And so Congress invited me to have look up the, the, the things that we could do. I'm not doing first-hand research, but I collected some, some information that nobody had really realized. That the IDB, the same study that we had done with the World Bank on the impact on GDP for net zero by 2050, well, they, they had actually looked at what happened if we did 2040. And the surprise is, actually, of course, you would get more growth, right? The longer time you have with cheaper energy, you get more growth and more investment. So first off, first evidence, if we do net zero by 2040, more growth. Second, we've really overlooked probably the most important tool that we can have on mitigation. Carbon Pricing Le uh, Leadership Coalition and the High Level Panel for the World Bank put together with Stern and Stieglitz said that we should be looking around 100 uh, dollars per ton. And the IMF, my good friends there, we worked, I, I asked them to run some numbers for me. Um, and for example, if we use $30 per ton of CO2, which is a, the, the value that we're trying to promote, uh, we have net, uh, not, not net, absolute redu reductions of emissions for Chile by itself. And when you have requirements for more spending, it's good to have more revenue. Kristalina Gorgieva uh, who was my boss at the World Bank, uh, who's the IMF head, she said carbon prices are job-creating taxes. They shift economies towards something else. And so I think it's a, it's a good tool uh, that we should try. And the, the World Bank IMF put together in the context of the Coalition of Finance Ministers what different uh, pr carbon prices would mean for Chile in terms of reductions. And you, you could also see in the U.S. And no, I guess they didn't do U.S. because the U.S. Is, wasn't part of the coalition in 2020, it is now, but you can see different carbon prices uh, leading to different reductions. You know, for example, Poland could get almost 50% reduction with different prices. Of course, it's gonna be politically hard to do. So we didn't consider carbon pricing as a tool at all. And my, my, my criticism of the administration is that if you didn't consider carbon pricing, which is the most promoted tool by the IMF and the World Bank, it was purely out of ideological reasons and you, so, so we had had this discussion and we had said it was all technical, but it wasn't totally technical. There's another aspect that's important for us too. Um, the World Bank put out a report looking at what would happen if the whole world met their two degree commitments. Not 1.5 because they, 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 for some reason they did uh, two degrees. And you can see that the transition for clean economy requires substantial amount of minerals. So this is something we have to discuss a little bit more because a lot of people um, you know, are concerned that this might generate this new extra extractivism and we'll shift from uh, you know, having these oil-based economy and having high impact some places. And you probably heard about the concerns on cobalt in Congo and lithium in indigenous communities in Chile 
overall. But the reality is, uh, for example, for copper in Chile, which is our, our major commodity, a lot of it will be required for this, these new technologies. And on some, in some, double the copper is required for net zero globally. So then when we go back to the conversation I have with Finister Finance, what's in it for us to bet do net zero? Yeah, well, we sell double our major commodity. Not a bad thing. But it won't come at, it won't be a free thing because this is a IDB report showing embodied emissions. And so you can see all the different emissions in Latin America. So Trinidad Tobago, for example, major uh, natural gas exporter, a big portion of the emissions they export, right? Uh, and, and in the case of Mexico, also a fossil fuel uh, producer, it's a big portion. But Chile, we're not fossil fuel producer but actually, we're pretty much up there with, with any of them. And so, because we transform these fossil fuels into our favorite commodity, copper. So that means that we should be wary of any taxes on end products. And lo and behold, the EU has announced, and they're still going full steam ahead, on a border tax adjustment uh, based on the embodied emissions of a product that they will import. So therefore, if a copper is going to, to, uh, to the European market, there'll be a tax based on the emissions. So that makes us uh, want to do this faster. Finally, hydrogen. We've all heard about it. Everybody thinks it's a really big promise. This is not the blue, blue uh, hydrogen that Mark Jacobson was tweeting about today. Uh, it's, uh, it's the green hydrogen made from uh, renewable energy. And our uh, projection is since we have such cheap energy, we could have a around 160 megatons and we could be the cheapest and even, uh, uh, even though we might be further away than China, EU or the US, or this could probably overcompensate the fact. And if we do deliver on everything we want on hydrogen, we will be looking at 330 a uh, billion dollars in investment for 300 gigawatts of energy, which is 10 times the energy that Chile uses today. So it can change things substantially and actually it could replace mining altogether. So my dream is, you know, we have mining, we'll have an expiration date, but the, the transition for mining to be renewable in the sources could leave an uh, outstanding legacy of hydrogen be produced. So what I've described is not something that would only be part of what a Minister of Environment should be concerned about. I just described what Nick Stern calls the growth story of the 21st century. It's the transformation of our economies to a new climate economy. So in Chile, I'm known for not getting along with Ministers of Finance, but I decided I didn't want to have more fights. And at the World Bank, what we did was very much an inception of putting together around 20 ministers of finance, got them in a room in Helsinki two, uh, four, three years ago, and we decided to, have to do the Helsinki principles. And that is an outstanding change. And this guy here, you might recognize him now, but nobody knew who he was then. He was the, and then the minister of finance for Germany, the vice chancellor today, Chancellor Olaf Scholz, and you saw today that uh, the Germany is committing to 100% renewable by 2035. So this is, now here's the, the, the things that we have to be looking out for, which are probably the biggest push that we could do. First off, there is this network of greening the financial system that today accounts for 85% of global GDP, including the Central Bank of China. They're all committing to having companies declare two things. Uh, they're their economic consequences to their assets due to climate change, their physical risks, or their transitional risks due to regulations. Selling stuff that nobody wants to buy, right? If you're a fossil fuel dependent country, you're not gonna be able to sell all the oil. oil. Uh, if you are an oil company, you should be shifting to something else. And the pressure that could be used is substantial and massive and direct. BlackRock, for example. BlackRock tells the CEO of NL, Big, uh, big company. 
you're not phasing out coal fast enough, the result, and I'm, I'm a witness to this, the result was NL and NG committed to phasing out all their coal-fired power plants by 2025 in Chile. That was financial pressure. Pension fund system also. Uh, the IDB put out a report that showed that, I mean, that the pension funds would have been way more profitable, in, well, somewhat more profitable, depends, uh, than if we had done green pension funds than not. So now the, the Chilean financial regulator for banks, for pensions, for companies, they all require financial disclosures. And the stranglehold will start, you know, first you declare, that's the plan, then is it aligned to the Paris Agreement? Is it aligned to our net zero? And if it's not, then it has to be aligned or you pay a penalty for this. So the Glasgow Financial Alliance of Net Zero probably is the most outstanding result for the Glasgow meeting. If you look at the, what they're committing to, and I know there's a lot of greenwashing. I know we gotta get better, right? The first thing is we get them in, then we start becoming the methods overall to be increasingly stringent. But today, the reality is that major banks have committed to 130 trillion in climate finance by 2050, and that's never been heard of before. The, you know, the climate finance today is probably maybe f from banks, probably MDBs, no more than 70 billion a year. So 130 trillion is a big departure. So why can we aspire to net zero by 2040? First off, we have to use carbon price. Second, we, we, uh, we, we have to uh, phase out coal faster. Third, we have to understand that we're always wrong about these numbers. We projected solar PV to cost $15 per megawatt hour by 2030. Turns out last year it was at, came in at 40, at 14, cheaper. 10 years ahead of schedule almost. CSP, same thing. 55 by 2030, well now it's 33 last year. So I think it, you know, we have to be more nimble about the analytics we do because many times it's set up in old school mentalities. We haven't analyzed a 100% renewable target. Uh, we haven't analyzed the GDP impact of double copper demand. We haven't looked at what the green hydrogen will do for us. I mean, we, have, we haven't looked at the fact that we plan on selling 15 times our emissions, right? So maybe, maybe some of that could be used to reduce our emissions faster. That's the end of that part. I'm gonna talk briefly on the methane hub. Methane hub is, uh, as uh, Rob uh, said, is, uh, is the coordinated effort by philanthropies to address the methane agenda. And I'll, I'll just uh, tell you why it's important at this point. Today, the report for the IPCC showed that if we overcome 1.5 degrees, there'll be tipping points and, and effects that will be irreversible. So we have to make sure that we're not gonna exceed that. It doesn't matter if we, if we exceed it and then cool off. No, we need to never exceed 1.5 degrees. And so if we look at recent warming, there's been a substantial contribution from methane, from the short-lived pollutants. And we've been looking at these things with some bias against taking short-term action. When we look at methane, it's in a 100-year uh, outlook, it's around 25 to 28 times more potent. That's why you know, we reduce methane historically. But if we look at this scale, the scale in which you know, we all plan to live, it's actually 80, 86 times more potent. So whatever we do on methane is gonna be able to deliver gains now and not in 100 years or 200 years. So very important. Where is it coming from? It forces us to get into sectors we had forgotten. Waste sector, ag sector, fossil fuel, and again, we could have these direct benefits to whoever mitigates. That's another good thing. So we're supporting this based out of the methane pledge. The global methane pledge was 110 country effort launched at COP in which uh, dozens of world leaders supported and it's led by the US. And the objective is to reduce emissions uh, of methane in the short term. And if we do so, we could actually reduce temperature within our uh, lifetimes. And most of the measures we could do are actually very cost beneficial. And finally, we'll do what we needed to have been doing, which is having a food system that's good for people and the 
planet, and it's, today it's neither, right? 30% overweight population globally, 10% malnourished population, and with all the pollution problems we've seen. So we're doing uh, things like, for example, working with different satellite observations, and, and there's different researchers at Stanford that are supporting this to, to measure and, and look at the real leaks, and we're figuring out that landfills were actually emitting way more than we expected, wells and pipelines doing way more. And so we'll be doing all this work out of Santiago and uh, looking at the different sectors uh, that we could address. And so finally, I just wanted to say, net zero is both a technical challenge but also a political decision. And I do like the fact that uh, Amory Levin says, you know, our energy future is our choice, not fate. And I think these things are things that we have to have in mind. We cannot rely on the technocrats, which I am part of, to say the reasons why you can't do something. Yep, the political leadership is, we will achieve this and we'll figure out how to do it. And a lot of this thing, the things are happening today in California, you know, which you don't, they don't know exactly how you're going to reduce methane emissions, but we work together on it. And we know we have to do it. Uh, I think uh, Christina Figueres, uh, who was a former UN head for climate change, would say, you know, when you, when you tell, when you get on a cab, you don't tell it, go this way, this way, this way. You tell it, I want to go there. And the cab driver figures it out. But you, know, but you have to tell it where you want to go. I think if we are only going uh, to, the, to our, where our, our minds set us out, we're just not going to get to the uh, transformations we require. We have to be bold, and therefore, 2040 is what my personal commitment is that Chile could achieve in a zero. So that's my presentation. Thank you very much for your time. I did. We have a few minutes now for public questions in the room here. I thought uh, after that inspirational talk, uh, can you hear me? Yeah. Any questions in the room? If nobody raises their hand, I'm going to call in my colleague, Rob Jackson, who I'm sure has questions. Let's go up there. Um, so you brought up this taxi analogy. How often is it that uh, in the Chilean government people are disagreeing where to go? Is there a lot of infighting, or is, is it really that, well, consensus? There, okay, so the process is about discussion. So, like, for example, for the energy system transition, 2013, the whole country was at odds with, we want to do large hydro in the Patagonia, we want to do big coal, and, but, but we really didn't have a consensus. So one of the big things that the Minister of Energy did was he did a national consultation process under which everybody discussed and looked at the same numbers and they came to that consensus. There's some this, uh, change, you know, different views on the, on, the, on the velocity. And obviously we're in the middle of a constitutional process that shows that you know, we're not that good at uh, reaching agreement, and, but we should do so also. But, uh, but uh, as long as there's a place for discussion with evidence, that's probably the best uh, place to, to work on it. So basically, the net zero target that Chile has today was a national public participation process, and we have the consensus of the NGOs, the people, and the, and the sectors in the government. So that's, you know, it's not perfect, but as long as we have those spaces to have the discussion, I think it's the best uh, formula. Any questions from the audience? Rob, did you have any? I know you're... I can ask. So once we go back to oh, the students. Sorry, sorry, Mr. Yeah. Uh, hi. Should, should I? No, go ahead. Okay. okay. Um, so we, you talked about in your speech a little bit about the uh, carbon cooperation with like Chile and Oregon, California, mm -hmm. and I was wondering if you could elaborate more on like policies and initiatives in which like a smaller country like Chile has collaborated with a larger um, global polluter. Mm -hmm. um, um, aside from like, you know, the really well-known local conferences. Mm -hmm. So there's the Japanese uh, clean yeah. development mechanism. It's a, it's, the Japanese have like their own in carbon market and they subsidize uh, mitigation and some, some actions have been taken in that regard. Um, the recent uh, cooperation with, uh, with the Canadian government on organic waste was also very uh, substantive. Uh, there's multiple different uh, car climate finance initiatives that allow that bilateral collaboration. The forest investment program, for example, with uh, reforestation uh, and MRV systems to prove that you 
planted the trees that you wanted and the mitigation that occurred was, was uh, okay. These are things that uh, have occurred, but uh, I don't have a much, much longer list. The problem though with the carbon market of the Americas is that uh, Chile, uh, now that they have this big commitment, they're not really too keen on selling credits because it would be taken off their books. And so uh, I, I have seen that uh, sort of awareness that I think is really um, interesting. Because, you know, for example, the New Zealand came in and they wanted to say, hey, you know, I'll give you money to phase out coal faster. And they're like, yeah, great, but we're not sure we're going to meet our commitment if we do that. Because that's going to be taken off our books. It's one of the low hanging fruits that we want. So therefore, it's gonna, it's, the tension of having everybody come into net zero is that there won't be that much of international uh, mitigation because everybody has to mitigate a lot. Any other questions? Right. I think you just uh, gave me an opportunity to use my uh, kind of pop metaphor. You, you remind me of Yoda. Remember the old saying, do or not do, there is no try. I think you're exactly that kind of guy and that's what we need. Anybody else? Rob, you want to ask one? Yeah, sure. So yeah. maybe philosophically, can you talk about your own philosophy in the, the methane hub, the, the balance of shame and cooperation for, for driving action? And I'll give you one example of which I, 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 uh, we did that was a little bit crazy, and I, I don't know how I, did, I kept my job, but it was fun, uh, but stressful. Uh, in the middle of the, when Chile become, became better at soccer, they started making it deeper into the tournaments. And we started measuring at the same time more pollution and with better instruments. And so we had the perfect storm of, you know, when I go into office, all of a sudden we, we obliterated all our air quality standards and records for, you know, we never measured anything as bad as we measured. And I tried to figure out what it was. And I, I had been looking at that data and I knew that data like it was my kids, right? I knew anything that was weird, I would figure out right away. There's something weird that happened that night, the time, et cetera. Everybody grilled, right? Everybody grilled and it, it was just, and every single day that the Chile played in the winter time, um, it was an emergency day. And if, we, if our model predicted it was gonna be sort of bad air day, when we factored in the soccer game, we, we said, oh, this is gonna be horrible. And it has implications because you ban wood burning stoves, you stop industry and you can't drive your car. Right, so it has deep implications. And so we went at that, right, and we showed that there was a problem. Um, people made fun of us at the beginning, had memes about us and, you know, that we're crazy blaming it on the pollution on grills. But then the data came in and actually the surveys came in. So today around 80% of Chileans acknowledge that grilling is bad. And 60% of women and 40% of men are in favor of banning uh, grilling during bad air days. So if there's no problem, there's no support, right? So the same thing with the shaming, this will be shaming both on an individual level and to country level. Uh, but if we have to show how the big problem that we got at hand, and, and we have multiple tools, that, including your work, uh, Rob, that will allow us to, to have that. Well, that's it. I think we're just about out of time for the public part of the Marcelo's presentation. So thank you once again for sharing with us your story. I think it's a very important one and a model for what might uh, well uh, be going, hopefully going on in other jurisdictions in the years ahead. Thank mm -hmm. you so much. Thank you. Well, we're always following the California way. We like to think of ourselves as a California of Latin America. Come back. <laughs> we'll, we'll take you out. To, we'll be able to take you out to dinner. Hopefully next time you get here. Thank you. Thanks so much.